The Doña Paz is the largest peacetime ferry disaster in the world, claiming almost 4,500 lives in a matter of less than an hour. This accident shines the spotlight on an industry that's claimed the lives of thousands more. But is it the tip of an iceberg or just bad luck? Valeriana Duma is 14 years old. Her employer calls her Valerie. Valerie works for a family in Tacloban in the Philippines as a housemaid. Her dad doesn't like it, but the family can use the extra money. One of the perks of the job is when the family travel to Manila and they take Valerie with. On the 20th of December 1987, just five days before Christmas, Valerie is at the docks with her employers boarding the Doña Paz ferry. Valerie likes going to Manila, but she doesn't care for the ferry journey. It's always crowded, and now, days before Christmas, the ferry is more crowded than usual. While Valerie's employers have booked tickets, they had not thought to bring Valerie until the last minute, and so they don't have a ticket for her. When they get to the gate, they learn that all the seats are sold, but the ticket agent takes a small bribe and grants Valerie access with her employer. A common practice, especially around the holiday season. As they push past hundreds of people who are sitting and lying in the passageways, Valerie realizes there's no place to sit except on the top deck at the very back of the ship. Valerie's employers are anxious, but they've seen it before. They tell Valerie that the ship gets so busy at Christmas that there aren't enough life jackets for everyone on board, and so they've bought one for her. A small pang of fear shoots through her stomach. She doesn't like the idea of needing a life jacket. The Doña Paz was a ferry built in Japan in 1963. When it was launched, it had a passenger capacity of 608 people plus crew of around 50. It relocated to the Philippines in 1975 when its new owner, the Sulpicio Lines, deployed it to transport up to 1,518 passengers between Manila and Cebu. In 1979, it caught fire while underway. Luckily, all 1,164 passengers and crew survived because the ship was beached in shallow water which provided an escape route. The ship was gutted by the fire and written off as a total loss. Sulpicio Lines claimed on their insurance and then bought the wreck back from the underwriters and rebuilt it. While they were at it, they added another two decks to the original two decks but they didn't update her certificates of stability, which rates how stable the ship is when it's floating. What's more important is the ability to increase the passenger count. As a flagship for Sulpicio Lines, it's reassigned to a route between Tacloban and Manila with a stop in Catbalagan, which it completes twice a week. The Doña Paz departs Tacloban at 06.30 in the morning, stopping at Catbalagan and then continues to Manila for arrival at 0400 the next morning. Valerie sits quietly, huddled on the aft deck. A man near her relieves himself over the side of the ship. There are too many people to fight his way to the bathrooms. The captain of the Doña Paz, Eusebio Nazarino, and his crew do everything they can to accommodate their passengers or possibly to accommodate more passengers. Luckily, the weather is calm and clear. The sea is a little choppy, but Valerie doesn't mind that much as long as it's warm and dry. For a ferry like Doña Paz, these conditions are almost ideal, and so the passengers and crew settle in for the journey. At around 22.30, the Doña Paz is in the Tabla Strait. Seemingly out of nowhere, an oil tanker appears almost immediately ahead of the Doña Paz. It collides with the tanker in an explosion of twisting metal. The tanker's petrochemical cargo bursts into flames and pours into the ferry. The 51 meter long oil tanker Vector is traveling from Bataan to Masbate with over 1 million liters of gasoline and petrol products. It's under charter by Caltex, which is a joint venture between Chevron and Texaco. The Vector is crewed by 13 people, but the captain of the ship and his first mate are not qualified for their positions. Passengers and crew on board the ferry are jolted awake as panic and flames engulf the two ships. The flames from the tanker's cargo are spilling out onto the sea and forming a cauldron of floating flames that spread hundreds of meters in diameter. To avoid the fire in the ship, passengers are jumping overboard into the flaming sea. 
they have to fight their way through the flames, charred bodies, black smoke and shark infested waters. On the ship, passengers search for life vests, but they're locked away and there's certainly not enough for almost 4,500 people on the overloaded ferry. The temperature is rising. The petrol from the oil tanker continues to spill into the ocean, fueling the fire around the two ships. Valerie is jolted awake from a shallow sleep. A man next to her is with his daughter. He's shouting for people to get off the ferry. That man is Salvador Bascal, a fisherman who's seen flames on boats before and knows how quickly they can spread. Now Valerie feels something different. She's relieved that she has a life jacket and terrified that she's going to get to use it. But she's not going to wait around to find out if the flames will make it to the back of the ship. She can see the flames on the water and the circle is growing quickly, so she jumps overboard with Salvador and his daughter. A passing ship sees the explosion and sails towards the flames. It takes the MS Don Claudio an hour to get as close as safely possible, then throws a net over the side of the ship for survivors to climb. In fact, it only gets within a two mile radius of the burning ships. Going closer means it would start to sail into patches of fiery water, which any sensible captain would avoid in order to keep his ship and crew safe. Luckily, it comes up to the rear of the Doña Paz. Valerie, Salvador and his daughter are three of only 26 people to survive. They had to swim for over an hour to stay out of the reach of the ever-growing ring of fire caused by the petroleum burning on the surface of the water. In fact, most of the people that survived were those that jumped from the back of the Doña Paz and were lucky enough to swim in the direction of the MS Don Claudio. Over 4,000 people died in the flames and sinking ships. The Doña Paz sank in 1,500 feet of water two hours after it struck the oil tanker Vector, which sank two hours later. One survivor recounts trying to pull his daughter to safety, but the skin on her arm slides away and she sinks back into the ocean. For a ship that's registered to carry 1,518 people, the Doña Paz was carrying 4,374 people, including the crew. Valerie was not the only person to board the ferry without an official ticket. The ferry was overloaded by almost 3,000 people over its authorized limit. It takes almost eight hours for the Philippine Coast Guard to be notified. Then another six hours for them to raise the closest Coast Guard station. The Doña Paz and the Vector have long since sank. In the weeks and months that follow, the question on everyone's mind is, how could this happen? Two vessels at sea on a calm and clear night collide and almost 4,500 people die. The investigation starts to uncover a litany of offences. Between the 13 crew on the Vector and 56 crew on the Doña Paz, there was only one sailor on watch and he was an unqualified apprentice. The crew on the Doña Paz were drinking and certainly not at their assigned stations. The captain was watching a movie. Maritime law requires a watch at all times. If crew were on watch at their stations, they would have seen the oncoming ship with enough time to alter course. The blame is ultimately assigned to the tanker, which was understaffed. The crew on board were not qualified and the tanker was operating without a certificate of inspection. Perhaps the blame was assigned to the wealthier oil company with deeper pockets. But the ferry was not without blame. It was overloaded to the point that passengers were sleeping in the hallway and the ship was listing to one side under the top heavy weight. Although overloading was not the cause of its sinking, more lives were lost because of corrupt practices at every level of the inspection process that allowed it to sail with so many passengers. All the life vests were locked away and it had no radio to communicate with ships that might be on a collision course. These factors contributed to the severity of the accident. But the one thing that would have avoided the accident entirely was having an appropriate watch system on either one or both ships. The tanker didn't appear out of nowhere. There was simply nobody on watch to see it coming. To me, there's one major omission in the investigation, and that comes down to the fact that two ships are operating without any oversight from the law. If one ship is poorly manned and unlicensed, you could blame the captain. But when two ships in the same waters suffer the same ailment, you have to look at the climate in which they operate. 
The Donya Paz is able to get her certificate of inspection and a license to carry passengers even though it doesn't have an up-to-date certificate of stability after adding two extra decks. The Coast Guard, who are responsible for inspecting ships to make sure they are not overloaded, are accepting bribes to look the other way, particularly in the holiday season. Large oil companies like Chevron and Texaco are chartering ships that aren't properly licensed and don't have qualified crew. At every stage of the inspection process, the authorities not only aren't doing their job, they're actually accepting bribes to look the other way, while companies put their passengers and cargo at risk in the name of profit. This culture created an environment that allowed two ships to operate unchecked. What likely started as a practice of overbooking by one or two extra passengers turned into overloading the Doña Paz by almost three times its registered capacity. This culture turned a blind eye to crew members having a beer on duty and not manning their stations. This same culture of corruption allowed the tanker Vector to sail with an unqualified crew, also not at their stations. In 2015, Sulpicio Lines lost their license to carry passengers not before three more of their ships sank, with a further loss of almost 1,500 lives. In the 15 years prior to the Doña Paz accident, there were 80 collisions, 177 sinkings, 53 fires, and a total of 4,000 deaths on board ships off the waters of the Philippines. Including the Doña Paz, that's over 10,000 people in a 43-year period. That's roughly 232 deaths per year. But the Philippines has over 7,000 islands and must rely on ferries for transport. By the very nature of being on the sea rather than the roads, you have to expect there will be accidents at sea. Vietnam has roughly the same population, but its geography is not dominated by islands like the Philippines. In 2016, the death toll on the roads of Vietnam was over 24,000 people in just that one year. By comparison, roads are far more deadly. During the investigation into the Doña Paz accident, senior members of the Coast Guard acknowledged that officials sometimes accept bribes to look the other way. They also point out they're understaffed and don't have the resources to inspect every ship. Valerie never received the $500 compensation offered to families of the victims because she was not registered on the manifest. She didn't have enough money to return home, and it took 25 years to reunite with her father. Sulpicio Lines now sell cargo instead of passengers. Since 2016, there have been 113 deaths in maritime accidents, making it one of the safest means of transport in the Philippines. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video and would like to watch more videos from this channel without any ads, consider joining our Patreon. The link is in the description. You can join for free or select a membership with benefits ranging from ad-free videos through to early access and live Q&A calls. I look forward to meeting you there.